Hey, everybody. So, hello, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so just so everybody. Um, yeah. Cool. So do me a favor, um, if you guys can actually turn your videos off. And the reason is it'll cut it'll cut the bandwidth down. Um, my guess is we're gonna get pretty close to maxing out this room. So uh, I just wanna make sure that we allow as many people in here as possible. And the more video we have, the, the harder it's gonna be. Welcome. How's everybody's weekend going? Mm. Okay, so do me a favor again. Yep, everybody's video's down. Um, and then everybody sees the chat. You just get to the chat window. There you go, perfect. I have no problem. Um, you can you can ask me questions. Um, sorry, you can ask me questions in the chat or voice. But obviously, we're gonna need to do this one person at a time. So uh, so we'll kind of go there. I can share my screen if that becomes a problem. Can everybody, can everybody else hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Um, so let me, I'm gonna give people a little bit more time to show up because I just, I feel like more and more people will kind of try to chime in. Just give them a few more minutes. And then I have a clarification that I'm gonna send out um, by email to the whole class as well. There's a something about correlation that seems to be confusing, even confusing for the TA, so I understand why it's confusing to you. All right, I'm glad you can hear. Okay. Yeah, my guess is people will probably be popping in. I've got an hour for us, so I'm thinking maybe we'll just get started. Um, just so we don't run out of time. So one thing that's been confusing for people, um, the problem, yeah, finding power, sure. Um, so correlation has a formula that uses n minus one in the denominator. But when you look for degrees of freedom for significance, we say it's n minus two. Both those things are true at the same time. So um, I think Carolyn was having a hard time explaining that to you guys, but um, in, the, in the formula we use the sum of zx times zy all over n minus one, that is really n minus one while the degrees of freedom for the significance tests are n minus two. So um, I just want to clear that confusion up. I'm going to send an email to the whole class about that as well. So I've got a request for a question on power. What are some other questions? Cohen's D, all right.
now you guys have studied, right? So now it's like, you know, you know exactly what you need help with, which is good. Uh, and then the question, yeah, so the n minus one and n minus three, yes, n is the number of pairs. Cool, okay. So I'm gonna get to some of these more conceptual questions first and then uh, for the correlation on the final. No, we won't go past five, five pairs. Okay, so difference between treatments, levels, and occasions. Great question. Um, so, Forget treatments for a second. I'll explain that it's like a synonym almost. Whether we're talking about a one, um, a one variable study, like a one way between subjects, or a factorial ANOVA, we, we have an independent variable with levels, right? So let's say we're doing a medication study. It could be three levels, no medication or placebo, low dose and high dose, right? Those would be the levels. Um, so levels is kind of the bigger term. In one way between groups, the idea is each one of those levels is experienced by a different set of people. That's why in one way between subjects, it's called the between groups effect, right? Because you've got three let's say levels, but different groups of people experiencing those. If that makes sense to everybody, just say yes. Just like tap that little thing for yes. Okay, cool. Um, so those are levels. The next piece of the puzzle is occasions. The way the book talks about it, and I'm okay with it, although I'll explain the overlap here in a second. Let's say if you're doing a study where, I mean, I'll use the same example with the medication, even though it's not an ideal study, but if you have a condition, uh, a study, where people get a placebo at one point in time, then later on they get the low dose, and then later on they get the high dose, you get the same group of people. So there's only one group. And so the book makes the distinction of calling those between occasions. So still three levels, right? The condition still has three levels. Before those three levels were experienced by three different groups. And now they're experiencing, they're being experienced at three different occasions. Okay. So levels and occasions. Uh, I also included kind of an idea about groups there. Treatments is not really part of the ANOVA language, but in many situations when the different groups are getting different treatments or the different occasions are experiences of different treatments. So some studies have to do with treatments, some do not. Um, that's not really part of the vernacular, not part of the language specifically for The ANOVA. Hey, those of you, sorry, it's, I swear it's nothing to do with any of you specifically, but those of you who have video, just do me a favor and turn it off just um, so we can save on bandwidth. You can, there's just a little button over there. Maybe later if you, if you ask a question and want to speak or something, that's not a problem, but I just want to save bandwidth when we can. Okay, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, occasions is another word for groups, exactly. I would, look, other than the, the knowledge of what it means in the test as language, they're essentially completely the same for you. How to find the calculations for the interaction row in factorial chart. Um, okay. So you don't have to do calculations in factorial, the only calculations you have to do are within the source table. And if that's what you're talking about, then the the part for the factorial, let me see if I have, 
a chart for this. Let me just say this quickly first. The part for um, the row for factorial is calculated exactly the same way as each of the separate rows. So you've got sums of squares, degrees of freedom, and MS, right? Sums of squares, degrees of freedom, and MS. In the interaction, the sums of squares is still added up to the sum depending on all the others. I'm not teaching you how to calculate it separately. You will not need to know how to calculate it separately. But again, um, sums of squares of factor one, factor two, and the interaction and the residual all together should equal total. So that's one thing. Degrees of freedom for interaction are calculated by multiplying um, A and B. So the degrees of freedom of factor A times the degrees of freedom of factor B. I will go over power here in a second. And then MS is the same. It sums the squares of interaction divided by degrees of freedom of interaction equals MS. Okay. Okay, so power seems to be a pretty big question and makes sense since we've just done it. Mm, okay. So, Riley, I see your question right there. Um, and what critical values are you defining? Okay. Okay. So, a lot of questions on power. Um, good. So, that'll, that'll kind of direct us in terms of what to focus on. Okay, so here's the deal. When the book uses 1.64, let me actually ask the question. We've got the chat right here. When the book uses 1.64, what is it telling you? This has to do with a few of the questions you guys just asked. I want to see if anybody has the answer to this. When the book tells you in the answer that you needed to use 1.64, what does it tell you? Yep, that it's a directional test. Perfect. So 1.96 leaves two tails, plus or minus 1.96, each of them having 2.5% combined for an alpha level of 0 0.05. 1.96 and negative 1.96. If I go one directional, either positive 1.64 or not at the same time, or negative 1.64, that means that I'm in a directional test, alpha still equals 0.05, but now all 5% are concentrated either on the high end or the low end of the, uh, the distribution. Perfect. So those of you who just answered that, that's the exact answer. Um, it has nothing to do with the standard deviation of the study. That's not, that's not why that would change. Let me find us a power problem. Okay, so I'm gonna experiment with something here. This is supposed to give me a whiteboard. So I'm gonna kinda of try to work through a problem. I should still be able to see the chat, right? Hmm. Okay, so I can still do a chat. Uh, everybody give me a second here. Let's see if this works better than when I tried in class, okay? First of all, way better than it was in class. Cool. Um, okay. Somebody asked what it would take to do a two-directional test. Uh, sorry, a one-directional test. Just like before, to do a one-directional test, even for power, I would have to tell you ahead of time that the researchers or the people studying this um, believe that the effect would go in one direction, 
and that there's a lot of evidence in that direction. Um, so, oh God, I can do a different color here. Damn, yes I can. Man, I wish it was this easy to do this while we were in class, trust me, okay. So let's, I see my video. So let's imagine for a second that the problem is, maybe I can type this out. So I'm just gonna try to set up a problem for you, okay? you guys still see that or is that too small? These old machines create 100 parts per hour and then no machine. Okay, I didn't make this one easy, because you know, I don't like making a lot of things easy. The question on the test is actually easier than this one, but let's see how this one goes. Where do I start? What are my variables? What does mu1 equal? Yep. What does mu2 equal? Bam. No, oh, 110. Right, because it's supposed to be 10% faster. Old machine creates 100 parts per hour, 110. Perfect. What's the next thing I need? Standard deviation, that equals 10, right? What else do I need? Perfect. Last piece here. Standard 
standard, I'll just do SE for standard error, and that equals 10 divided by square root of 25, right? So five. Does everybody understand why it's 10 standard deviation divided by five? You guys already said it, right? Yeah, okay, standard error, perfect. All right, what's next? Find a critical X, so X bar, we've got two means here, right? We've got one, we've got two. Man, I wish I could have done this the whole quarter <laughs> in class. Um, okay, now here, just to put this so we know, this is mu one equals 100. And this is gonna be right here, mu two, which equals 110. Okay, X critical, I hear 103.92. Why is it 103.92? This is so not to scale, it's not even funny, but please stick with me. Right, so two times 1.96. And why is it two again? Perfect. So, 1.96. Times standard error equals three point nine two. Sorry, I want to make all this smaller here. One hundred and three point nine two equals X critical. No, it's not a directional test, sorry. It's not a directional test because like I said, you need two things for a directional test. And I only gave you one, right? You want me to draw the second line here? You don't have to draw both lines. It's a directional test heat is he believes it works faster than his old machines. There are two conditions for you to be running a directional test. A, he's got to believe it. B, there's got to be previous research or something like that that I got to tell you. I'm going to stick to that as, as our guideline because otherwise it gets too complicated to try to figure it out. So both of those things together have to be there. Got it? Cool. So 1.96 times standard error is 3.92. 103.92 is the critical value. What's the next thing we got to do? Yep, Z2 now, right? So we do Z2, and what does Z2 equal? One hundred three point nine two minus one ten divided by Oh you got it already right. Negative 3.04. Now here, bef before we even move farther, I want you all to think about this, right? So we have 100 for group one and 110 for group two. Once you figure out standard error, I want you to think a little bit and you can see that there are five standard errors away from each other, right? Given the sample size. So first of all, right away, the two means are five standard errors away from one another. Is that a lot of power or not a lot of power? A lot of power, right? Good. 
if you remember the five elements that tell you whether you get more power or less power, the more distant the two means, the more power you have. Five standard errors is a big distance. Perfect. So now negative 3.04. And then somebody asked, how do we find the exactly uh, bigger effect size? Perfect. So how do we find now from negative 3.04, how do we get to power? You got to look at the Z table. And what you'll see is that it says, let's say, yeah, let me see. Why is it a bigger effect size? We're going to get to calculating D in a minute, but D is all about the distance between the two distributions, right? I'm saying five standard error distance is a big distance. Um, you can even calculate, by the way, even in terms of effect size, right? Cohen's D is mu one minus mu two divided by standard deviation. So the effect size here is one, which is even bigger than the 0.8 cutoff for a big effect size. So I'm going to look at this real quick here, Z table. So everybody should be looking at a Z table, negative 3.04. And there are a few different things that you can look at if you want to. I don't think you guys can see what I'm looking at right now. But... So if you look at the area beyond, 3.04 it is 0 0.0012 let me get back to my board area beyond equals 0 0.0012. That's a tiny part of the distribution, right? Now, if you think about it, nope, hold on. So, sorry, beyond. So, when we look at this Z, the area beyond it is this part, right? Oh, sorry, somebody said beta. Sorry, yes, 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 beta is 0 0.0012. I, I read that as uh, power. So how do I do this? Fill, can I fill something? Dun, dun. Okay, I don't think it's gonna let me fill, so let me just try to do this. I'm gonna put a different color here. Yellow looks good. So this area right here, and I'll write beta in here in a second, but yeah, sorry for whoever I said that to before. Yes, this is beta, right? which is the opposite of power. So right here, beta. Okay, not in yellow. Cool. So this right here is beta, and this, what color should we pick now? Come on, green. Okay. And this area right here is power. Now, the reason I always tell you to draw it, and you know, my drawing skills, especially on this computer, are incredible, um, is once you do that and you kind of look around and make sense of it, you can pretty easily tell that we should have a lot of power in this study. And indeed, I mean, I would say we have actually 99.9% .9 power, right? So much bigger than even the 80 that we would require. That makes sense? So uh, second line from the right one to this one. Yeah, that is a critical value. Exactly. Um, if I said he, he believed that, um, it would work faster and this is done based on a bunch of research. It's just then 
then it would be if those two requirements are in there at the same time. And the reason I'm doing that, guys, is not because this couldn't be a one directional, but on a test, unless I tell you if it's directional or non-directional, I don't want any leeway. So two things that I would have to tell you. He believes that it's uh, directional, that it would go one way, and uh, a lot of past work that he's done with this or a lot of past evidence that he's looked at suggests that it would be that. Make sense? If mu2 was on the other side of mu1. Yeah, I mean, we have, right here we have, Z equals negative 1.96. We got colors galore in this thing. Yeah. So, but you're asking the question about what if this entire distribution right here was on the other end? So the answer is yes. Okay. I also saw something on Cohen's D, so I'll go over that. Um, but is this okay? Yeah, because a machine could be slower, right? We so here's the here's the issue. This is and I get that this is why it's hard because we're creating all these made up scenarios, right? Um, I am telling you that the machine is at one ten, but when he does it, he believes that it is. He doesn't know that it that it really is. So if think about it this way, if he did a one directional test, he would only be testing in. Let me draw this real quick. If he did a one-directional test, he would, on, he would only be testing in this region, right? Um, but if the machine didn't end up actually being faster, so we know because we're creating a problem on a test, but if his machine didn't end up being faster and it was actually slower, he wouldn't be able to tell, right? This way, he will be able to tell if it's faster or slower. He wants it to be faster. He believes it's faster, but he would be able to test it. I don't know. Maybe like his, uh, the manufacturer maybe offers a recall if it's actually not faster. Uh, so yes, power is one minus 0 0.0012. Now, here's the issue. 0 0.0012 is the area beyond this Z value of negative 3.04. Um, now, here's the issue. So one thing you can look at is the area beyond. The next thing you can look at is the area is the area between the Z and the mean, and then add 50%. Hey, Daniel, I gave two, re two things you would need to see in a problem in order to make it directional. So those would be the two things. What table do we look at to find power? So you, don't, you look at a Z table. You have a Z score. You look at the area beyond, um, beyond that area. So essentially, it's like, remember percentiles? This is the same thing as percentiles. You just find where that Z is and you find the relative area under the curve opposite of beta, beyond the rejection zone. Okay, I'm gonna clear this. Are we good to clear this? When you're looking at areas and you're trying to figure that out, look all the way back to percentiles and, and try to figure out if you understand that this area right here is power, then look back to percentiles and, and remember how to figure out what a size of an area is. Because that's exactly what we did when we did the percentiles and the region between. If you remember that silly um, rent or snowboard example we did in class and stuff like that. Uh, I heard Cohen's D, and I'll do that next. Anything else other than that? Okay. table okay <laughs> cool okay so let's just do this first as we talked about there's effect size and then there's effect okay size index effect size index is Cohen's D Okay, so effect size is literally mu1 minus mu2, right? 
Cohen's D is mu1 minus mu2 divided by standard deviation. Um, honestly, you really never really use um, raw effect size. People t typically talk about an effect size index of some sort. These are the two formulas you need for it. So in the example that we just gave before, mu1 was what? Perfect. Mu2 was 110. Standard deviation equal 10. Cohen's D would literally be uh, D equals 110 minus 100. It's actually the absolute value, but that's fine. Divided by 10 equals 1. So if you go back to the lecture on effect size, the reason we use standard deviation and not standard error is because standard error or significance calculations make us really, really sensitive to sample size. So you can make almost any difference on Earth significantly different from another group if you just use enough participants, right? That's the issue with power that we've talked about. But that doesn't apply to Cohen's D. So Cohen's D doesn't ma measure statistical significance. It measure, measures something else. What is it called? Practical significance. Great. And by the way, as we're doing this, here are all of our um, conceptual questions, right? Is why do we use standard deviation and not standard error? That's a perfect example of a um, conceptual question. And it has to do with taking away the power of sample size for measuring difference. Practical significance, not statistical significance. Does that make sense? Anything else on effect size that is confusing that you want to go over? Uh, Cohen's D table is not in the chapter, it's in the appendix. Oh, but wait, no, no, you don't, all you need for, um, for Cohen's D is not, um, there's no table for it. There are three values you need to know, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8 for small, medium, and large. Yeah. Sorry, somebody just unmuted themselves, so do me a favor and just press mute again. This gets hectic with 30 some people in it. Okay, I'm gonna close this for a second. You asked for Q. If somebody does have uh, a question you wanna ask, let me know. I mean, ask as in like, <laughs> speak. Can we go over how to find the safe sample size? Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, after the Q table, I think that's the next one up. And we went over one of those in class, but we will do another one here. Okay, let me share screen. Let's do this. Okay. Not the biggest table I've ever seen in my life. Let's see where this takes us. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's not a really big table, hold on.
You can do either in ANOVA after rejecting the null hypothesis. Wow, not really finding a lot of high quality pictures here. Hold on, hold on, guys. Dun, dun. Okay, I'm just gonna look at this example real quick for us. So reading a Q table, um, remember that the Q test itself looks exactly like a T test, right? So you get a, an observed Q instead of an observed T, but it's the same thing. It's one group minus another group divided by um, the standard deviation, standard error, sorry. So when we get the standard error for Q from MS within, divided by n, you take the square root of the whole thing. But, the, you know, so the test looks exactly the same and you read this the same way. The difference you have to pay attention to is up here. I can't, can you guys see this little finger like moving across this top row? I think you can, right? Yeah, okay. So in this row, just remember and note, it's gonna say it on the table, but just remember that um, it's k, not degrees of freedom. So it's literally the number of groups. So if in your ANOVA there are four groups, you don't use three here, you actually look at four. And degrees of freedom is your within groups degrees of freedom. So remember, if you're doing a two key, you've done an ANOVA before, or there is an explanation of how many groups there are and how many people in those groups, et cetera. This degrees of freedom right here is the within groups degrees of freedom. So let's say we have four groups, uh, each one of them has four people in it. Then you've got four right here, and uh, they each have four people in it, and there's 16, but you lose a degree of freedom for each, so you get 12, and we are here, 4.20. So the critical value would be 4.20. What do you mean, why? Because you have four groups, and the U.S. Okay, so um, again, if we have four groups, right and each one of them has four people in it what is the sample size okay now you lose one degree of freedom remember nova ms within so for degrees of freedom within you lose one degree of freedom for each group so you've got 16 participants you lose one degree of freedom for each group what does that leave you with Perfect. So remember that this is no, I mean, yes, that's another way to do it, but not the way I was just doing it is the 16 minus you lose the degree of freedom. So there are a couple of different ways to do it and it's they're in the degree of freedom calculation. Just make sure you're comfortable with one way of doing it. Um, you have four participants per group. If you lose one and you got to figure out three degrees of freedom per group, three times four is 12. Um, so that all those methods work just, stick to one so that you're doing the same thing. Now this is why I was saying from the get-go when we do ANOVA, do a source table. Because if you did a source table, all these things would be pretty easy, right? So if you have four groups, you get three degrees of freedom between. And you have 16 participants, so you have 15 degrees of freedom total. 15 minus three is 12 also. You're not gonna do anything after repeated measures other than, like I said, for um, for repeated measures, sorry, I read the F factorial. You can, do, you can do a two key after any ANOVA. So you can do a two key after any ANOVA. Uh, yes, repeated measures, yes, one way between. For um, factorial, you don't have to worry about two key. You don't have to worry about um, 
calculating things from scratch. You have to know how to fill out a source table. You have to know what the underlying reason, what the benefits of doing a factorial are compared to one ways. And you have to know how to tell apart the uh, interactions and main effects and all those sorts of things that we did in class. Let me go over this sample size from power problem. Okay. So for that, let me get this whiteboard back. So same thing. You're asking, okay, so a couple of different issues. The, the question here is, how do you find Q critical value after repeated measures? In repeated measures, you have two independent variables, the people and the occasions, right? People and occasions. If you're doing them for occasions, it's the exact same thing we just did. How many groups do you have? And what's the within group degrees of freedom? Let me see if anybody knows, this is a really good conceptual question. What would it be if I'm doing a two-key test? First of all, what am I testing if I'm doing a two-key test on the, uh, between subjects? What is the two-key test gonna show me? Nope, which people are significantly different from one another. If I do a two key on the between subjects effect, I'm looking at all the diff different people. So the Q value would be how many different people there are. You're never gonna do that though. Don't worry about it, but that's a really good conceptual question. Um, yes, the critical value is the same for all the groups. And somebody asked if there will all, only be two tailed. No, I can't tell you if there will only be two tailed. You gotta know when to do one tailed as well. Um, That's for the standard error. That's not the Q value. The Q, the Q value is the whole thing. The between occasions we use, yeah, perfect. Um, all right, let me get back to this drawing board. This actually kind of works well. Okay. So, Okay, let's start with something simple. What are the only answers you will be expected to find given a sample size calculation related to power? Let's just start with that. There are only three potential answers. Yep, 1433 and 196. What are those connected to? Yeah, Cohen's D. So let me, somebody literally just sent me this thing right here. All righty, uh, let me share this real quick. Can everybody see this? The, uh... cool. So this is that little chunk of the table that I asked you to memorize, right? Now, it's only for one sample tests, and I only asked you to memorize this, the, the part for 0.8 power. So 1433 and 196. Now, normally, none of those things would be standard. So you wouldn't know what power is and you wouldn't know what um, tests we're doing. But because I made all those things standard, there are only three different sample sizes. And they're all associated with different effect sizes. So, when you hear a question where in the end it asks you something about sample size, no matter how confusing the question gets, I need you to remember that I'm actually asking you about effect sizes. Because there are only three answers, and they 
the only way you know which one to choose is based on the effect size. So it doesn't matter how um, weirdly I word this question. Those are the things that you have. So now I'm going to go back to that question we had before. I don't have it drawn anymore, but you guys are following along, so I'm sure you remember because you're good like that. So let's see. Sorry, one second. Okay, so a question might look something like this. A factory owner bought a machine that he believes makes parts 8% faster than his current machines, which produce 100 parts per hour. Standard deviation equals 10. If he wants to conduct a study that examines whether his new machine is significantly faster, how many parts will he need to produce to have a power of 80% for his study? Is that question confusing enough? Yep, because the parts are the subjects in this, yes, right? I mean, yeah, I, look, that's not a giveaway. I'm asking, so subjects are whatever the things that we're producing. So how many equals the sample size, exactly? Perfect. But yes, some of you are confused by it. So again, what I'm asking is think about it this way. And this is why I'm kind of being as upfront about this as I can be. If I'm asking you a question about how many parts will he need to, how many subjects will need to be studied, how many times will they have to run the study in order to do it, then you do what Darla just said, right? This question, even though it's asking you how many people or how many parts, how many the people in this case are parts, you just got to find the effect size. So what's Cohen's D in here? 0.8. So how many, what's the answer? 14. So this is a perfect case of, um, again, I'll remind you, you were all in algebra class at some point 
when questions went from, you know, x equals 5, y equals x plus 2, you know, what is y and what is x, and then, you know, some more complex versions of those. For a while, math looked like that, and then one day somebody said, Joey has 5 cents, and Maria has, you know, Sorry, Joey has X cents and Maria has two cents more than him and they're going to the store and they want to buy some candy and the candy costs, you know, seven cents a piece and, da, 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 and they kind of walk you through this whole thing. And the thing that was so hard in algebra class about that was your job was to figure out what numbers that are given are the ones that you need to use and how do you use them. So let's look back at this problem with that sensibility because I know some of you said, yes, this was confusing. You read this whole thing, a factory owned by a machine, 8% faster, his current machines make 100 parts. So I want you writing in the meantime, like 100 parts per hour, standard deviation equals 10. New machine, 108 per hour. Okay, he wants to conduct a study. Uh, okay, he wants power to be 80%. How many parts will he need? Wait, how many parts? He's asking about sample size. Sample size, figuring out sample size, the only, the only factor that matters for what you need to know for sample size is Cohen's D. So as soon as you see that question, you now go, oh, I'm figuring out Cohen's D. That's it. Okay, we've got uh, like five minutes. So let's do like a few end ones really, really quickly. It's like a end, end point. But um, I don't think... I don't think there's a, there's a part with three. Somebody asked about three groups instead of two groups for ANOVA and, uh, and interaction and main effects. I don't think we do that on the test anyway, but it wouldn't be different. Parallel lines, only main effects. Non-parallel lines, you've got interactions um, and all the other things still apply. Are tests all about causation? What do you mean by that? Lisa, what do you mean by our test all about causation? Right, so R is about a relationship between two variables and association. No, yeah, it's never, correlations are never about causation, ever. Another really good conceptual question. The hypothesis test is just about whether the relationship is significant or not. So not about causation, but just about whether it's a significant relationship or not. Good question. Uh, somebody else, a different type of ANOVA. So we've got three that you're doing. Let me see if I can draw this. What the hell is this thing? No, that is not useful. Um, I want to see if I can draw a table. All right. Let's see how annoying drawing a table is on this thing. That's not too bad. Unfortunately, there's not a faster way. I mean, there is a faster way to use it. Uh, computer you will not be doing that on this test okay <laughs> I feel you James um, squares piece of freedom MS I'm sure a lot of the other people on this call feel you too. Okay, so let's, uh, everybody understands this is the last thing we'll be able to do today, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we're gonna start with a source table. I wanna be clear, everybody knows this, that the last row is always total, right? So that we can just put in here. Bam. 
Well, I kind of like how the colors are different from these things. Okay. Now, one way, so I'm going to explain these in, in sequence. One way between subjects adds this thing right here. Come on. You can do it. All right. What is the first row? Yeah, it's between groups. I'm gonna call it between groups A. You'll understand why in a moment. And then it adds another line called within, right? Within slash residual. Within residual, same damn thing. Okay. So that's one way between subjects ANOVA. Here it is, the whole thing, bam. When you do repeated measures, it adds a line. That line is between subjects. If you're doing a factorial later, we'll call that line B, right? The factor, factor B. Works the exact same way as the rest of this thing. Oh, okay, don't do that. Oh, my God. All right. I'm just this over here. Okay, everybody understands this. So now on repeated measures between groups, between subjects, but between subjects is just another variable. The variable is subjects. And then factorial leaves an interaction right here so that makes sense how i built this thing out one way between subjects has three rows total between and within um repeated measures has four rows between uh, occasions between subjects residual or within and total and then factorial has five rows because we add interaction that's it all right party people um will we have to calculate source table from scratch no no in all the in all the source tables you will get there will be some things into it and then um and then some pieces of a word problem that will tell you kind of what we want you to do there. Uh, what else was there? Oh, and, and like you saw in class, right? You can go from a table that only has two values in it and a whole word problem attached to it and pretty quickly fill it in. And uh, for sums of squares, you will never have to do like total or residual sums of squares from scratch. But yes, you will probably have to do you will absolutely have to figure out what you know what to do, and you will probably have to do some sums of squares from scratch. And that might be the between occasions or between groups or between subjects. All right, I know some of you, wait, actually maybe none of you that are on right now, already had a final today. So sorry about that, <laughs> but I will see you all tomorrow. Uh, you're all so 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 welcome um feel free to still send questions or whatever but i hope this was useful this was nice this is also recorded i believe so i'll try to post it if i can will that be useful if i post this okay I will see if I can get that done right now. All right, everybody. Have a good evening. Um, don't forget to sleep. And I will see you tomorrow.